Hello, this is Markus Reed speaking and Eckhard Kanz. We will give a presentation on the Reed cell, sometimes called the crystal cell, and on quantum open systems. The crystal cell was a project that I began with in 1998, and uh, now in 2023, we would like to give an update on the overall situation. So let's get started with a few informations that are around the area of the crystal cell. What we have here on the left hand side is a report from uh, the Telegraph in 2003 and it shows a phenomenon in relation with water that points into an over unity situation. What is shown here is a container with water and the water is um, uh, yeah, diluted with uh, potassium carbonate and there are two electrons, electrodes. One is a tungsten electrode and one a, a platinum electrode. And when a current is put through both electrodes, an anomalous efficient heating of the water occurs. And uh, I will read this uh, statement here from the Telegraph. In results independently, independently verified at Bristol University, a team from Gardner Watts, an environmental technology company based in Dedham, Essex, show a thermal energy cell which appears to produce hundreds of times more energy than that put into it. If the findings are correct and can be reproduced on a commercial scale, the thermal energy cell could become a feature of every home heating water for a fraction of the cost and cutting fuel bills by at least 90%. In the following years, I have not heard an update from them. Uh, however, so I don't know what happened with it, uh, but I have read about uh, related experiments that also show an apparent uh, highly efficient heating effect with water. That's why I'm presenting it here. Here on the right hand side, we have a graph which is from uh, Professor Gerald's book which is called The Fourth Phase of Water, a book that I can highly recommend. Um, it is a, uh, a great compilation on the special or unique properties of water. And uh, what is found here on the left hand side on hydrophilic uh, surfaces is that water gets a negative charge and this negatively charged water is called here EZ or EZ. And that stands for exclusion zone water. And this exclusion zone water tends to push out positive protons away from the hydrophilic um, surface, making the water directly at the surface uh, having a negative charge and the water which is a bit further away, let's say a millimeter or two, has a positive charge. And when two electrodes, which are uh, chemically inert are placed one into the negative area one to the positive area a very weak electrical current can be drawn from it and uh, that shows that uh, water can not only build up an electrical charge um, however this energy uh, generation despite the fact it's small is permanent and the question is where does the energy for this effect come from? Now, in the relation with this, I want to present an effect that um, I have um, that I've developed here on the left hand side. Uh, from my view, we are living in two domains, so to speak, and one domain is made up from these classical or thermal fluctuations and the other domain from quantum fluctuations and uh, how quantum fluctuations affect our reality is seen at very low temperatures. And, um, but that doesn't mean that the quantum fluctuations play a role only at very low temperatures. They play a role until the so-called Debye temperature is reached. And uh, the Debye temperature can be seen as a measure where the quantum fluctuations still have a certain or let's say significant influence upon phase transitions, for example, of molecules. And uh, here is a statement um, um, from a paper 
that is called nuclear quantum effects and hydrogen bond fluctuations in water from the University in California, Berkeley in 2013. I will read it. Here we show using state-of-the-art techniques that allow for quantum mechanical effects in the motion of the electrons and nuclei that room temperature water, and that is very important uh, to me, we are speaking about room temperature water and not very cold water in form of ice or whatever. Uh, this water is not simply a molecular liquid. Its protons experience wild excursions along the hydrogen bond network that are driven by quantum fluctuations, which result in an unexpectedly large probability of transient autoionization events. So the, um, the key statement here, what are of importance, are that we have room temperature water and that the hydrogen bond oscillations are driven by quantum fluctuations. And that shows that water is actually a, um, a medium that can not only absorb thermal energy but also energy from quantum fluctuations and these quantum fluctuations determine the nature of the proton oscillation of the hydrogen nuclei. Now here on the right hand side is another example from Professor Gerald Pollack from his famous book The Fourth Phase of Water and here on the left hand side he presents a bottle of water that can be put in a very dark uh, environment and this, the water in the bottle will radiate a very weak light. It's a steady light emission. It's so weak that you cannot see it with the naked eye, but it can be measured. And uh, if you measure that bottle one year later, and during this year it has been permanently in a, in a dark room, uh, you will find that this water is still radiating uh, a, a weak stream of photons. So the question is now, where do, does the energy come from these photons? Some assume water is absorbing electromagnetic energy from the environment and then giving it off again. For example, the ambient heat could be converted into, into radiation. However, in that case, one would expect a slight cooling of the water and that could be measured calorimetrically. Um, such measurements are not known to me because the cooling in this case would be very weak, but that would be an interesting experiment to do. However, we did such experiments in relation with the crystal cell that point into that direction, where in the crystal cell we do not have a cooling under load. And um, here the statement by Professor Gerald Pollack, you might expect light output from some chemical reactions but they are of course not there. But continuing for over a year, either some magic is at play or the aqueous solutions must continuously absorb incident energy and convert that energy into the practically unending photon energy output that is observed. No need to belabor the point. The water solution acts as a light bulb delivering photonic energy practically endlessly. Now, my personal view on it is that water absorbs energy from quantum fluctuations and, the, and this energy from quantum fluctuations is converted into electromagnetic energy, meaning into light photons. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. What we uh, see here in the middle uh, is a graph that I designed in 1998 or 1999 and at that time I was a uh, uh, still a quite an outsider or newcomer to the topic so I had a purely intuitive and, and maybe a pretty naive way of approaching the topic and I came up with a simple picture that we have uh, two different electrodes an anode and a cathode and that at these surfaces could be Schottky-like diode surfaces. If there are Schottky-like diodes, we don't know. But anyway, that's the picture I had. And so I started to experiment to put in a, uh, um, a silicate structure that contains water. And um, 
and uh, yeah, and when an, uh, the, 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 the water oscillates, charges like electrons should be moved back and forth. And when they jump over the uh, diode barrier, which uh, diode is like a valve for electrons, then the electrons would get more and more on the cathode metal, having a surplus of electrons, and they would be then pushed by the electrical field from the, from the, that come from the electrons through the uh, plus pole. And there we have a Schottky diode-like surface that where the diode is facing or the valve is facing into the other direction. So we have a one-way road for electrons here. And then when they jump over here, they can't go back. So that could lead to a very weak electrical current. And uh, if this principle works, I don't know. Anyway, that was the schematic picture that I had in mind at that time. And today, actually, the picture has not much changed. Uh, we just don't know, is it a Schottky diode or whatever. Um, however, we, uh, yeah, or I uh, managed uh, to build a cell that generates a very weak electrical power. Here on the left-hand side, we have two crystal cells and um, one cell has about a weight of 330 grams and produces bet usually between 1.2 and 1.5 volts, depends on the cell. And in this example, they are put in a series because um, the voltage is not strong enough to uh, power an LED on a single cell. So that's why I have put two in series and that's enough to light up a green and efficient LED. And um, uh, now, uh, yeah, 20, 20, 24 years later, we have learned more. And uh, my uh, today's view is that the crystal cell uses the zero point energy, the quantum fluctuations to create the water oscillation. And that water oscillation separates the charges. And that is what creates the weak electrical power from the crystal cell. Here on the right hand side is a watch. It's a watch that you put onto the wall. And uh, I have to thank uh, my friend and partner Eckhart Kanz for this, uh, for this watch because it worked perfectly on one crystal cell uh, for a long time. And uh, then unfortunately it stopped, but with two of these cells it can work on a permanent basis. The watch needs about one and a half um, to two milliwatts uh, of permanent power to to operate however sometimes in winter when it gets colder then and, and the cells are very uh, sensitive to temperature changes it can be that it stops however when you just put your hand on the cell then again the watch continues to operate and this is the back side of the watch and down here on the right hand side you see the front side of that watch um, yeah on the headline is uh, I uh, developed that cell from 1998 to 2012 or 2013. Uh, however, I also did, um, after 2013, I did a few experiments here and there, but basically one can say sort of around 2012-ish, the, um, the, 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 the main focus on the research on the crystal cell was terminated and then I got into uh, another project which is called the FCO, the Ferroelectric Crystal Oscillator, and that is what we are developing today at Quantum Power Munich. And um, yeah, since I, especially at that time, had uh, no knowledge about chemistry, and actually today I still have no, I don't have <laughs> knowledge about chemistry, um, and uh, uh, not about physics, and not about uh, no, no uh, knowledge about uh, measurement technique, I consulted partners uh, to help me on that. And Eckhart Kanz was the first person to uh, conduct extensive measurement tests on the cell. And uh, he also kindly wrote a certificate um, that uh, lays out the properties of the cell. Then I had contact to a nuclear physicist, Dr. Hans Weber, and he wrote a little comment after investigating the cell. When I write, there is a comment here. It's just a few lines uh, basically saying that that person assumes that besides electrochemical effects, another effect could be or actually should be uh, existing. Um, another 
a friend of mine, Dr. Frank Lichtenberg, who is today at the ETH in Zurich and is from solid state physics, also wrote a comment. Then Sebastian Williams, an electronics engineer from the States, same thing, also a comment. Then Dr. Dieter Krzyzewski, who was um, a researcher uh, at the Forschungszentrum in, in Karlsruhe. He's a chemist and was familiar with the material system. He did extensive research over several years and he wrote a certificate and he came to the conclusion that the crystal or crystal cell recell is, um, uh, yeah, that there is not only a new effect, but that electrochemical effects play a minor role, if a role at all. And that was very kind of him to, uh, to do that research. I'm very thankful, uh, especially for his extended help as well. Then Professor uh, Karl Ernst Lotz, who is a chemist from silicate, uh, fr from th this type of, of silicates, he also wrote a comment and uh, we had com conversations between uh, Dieter Krzyzewski and Karl Ernst Lotz and myself and uh, he was also convinced that is uh, absolutely not comparable to a, um, a conventional electrochemical battery. There should be something else going on. Then a physicist, Dr. Nigel Dyer, who is now in the Netherlands or also involved in a, in a, in a uh, research project at Wetsuits. Uh, uh, he is doing some research right now, today. Uh, and uh, then at uh, some stage, that's also uh, was in around 2010, I think, I contacted uh, at the ETH in Zurich uh, um, Professor Jeroen van Bockhoven. He is one of the leading zeolite specialists in Europe. And uh, I showed him the uh, XRD measurement of the material composition uh, after the chemical reaction. And uh, he also could not um, visualize how this could generate an electrical current in the first place. Then um, I sent some cells to John Bedini, who is a famous researcher in the United States. Unfortunately, he passed away. He was a good friend of Tom Bearden, who was my mentor. In uh, and Tom Bearden is uh, was from from Huntsville, Alabama, in in, uh, in the States, and um, he had also uh, or he investigated these cells over years, and he also wrote a very nice comment on that also uh, supporting the view that this is a permanent energy cell. Uh, then I had contact with the Kutaisi Technological Academy in Georgia and nine professors and one a PhD uh, gentleman uh, took the cell into a box which was sealed and they made a dead shorts test over about half a year. And after six months, they opened the box and opened the dead short and they realized that the cell worked as before. And they wrote a, a very friendly comment. I didn't even ask for it. It was very kind of them to do that. Um, and um, that comment is also on uh, my website and uh, vacuumenergie.de and um, uh, yeah, showing or just uh, supporting that, that the crystal cell is a cell that creates a weak electrical current over an unknown period of time. Yeah, now we are um, uh, looking at the diagram, uh, how Ecker Kunz began to investigate him, uh, investigated the cells. And I will now uh, give the word to Ecker Kunz and uh, uh, yeah, just a short uh, story how I met Eckert that was in I think in, in August or the end of 2005. Right, yes. And uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, as I said before, I was uh, not, not experienced with measurement technologies and Eckhart was <coughs> that and I was very happy to meet Eckhart and, uh, and Eckhart I think was also happy to, to have uh, sure. the, the possibility to test something like that. And uh, I must say Eckhart brought light to the whole project and uh, thanks to Eckhart I got also into the research that we are today and um, uh, what I didn't expect at that point in time 2005 is how this project would develop over the next uh, years and uh, yeah Eckhart please I will give yeah please go ahead yeah I'm very thankful that I got the opportunity uh, to um, measure a, an energy de device which pours out 
uh, electrical energy con continuously. My background is uh, en engineering with a specialization of uh, to, to electrical systems, energy uh, systems, and I'm very interested in all kinds of new technologies. I also learned about books and articles from Tom Beden about the new tech, uh, yeah, te technology and um, theory about how electrical systems work. And uh, well, then in 2005, I started to uh, conduct experiments, measurements on the crystal cells. From a standpoint, point of view of an electrical engineer, one tries to uh, generate a vision what happens inside an energy converter. And the result is usually an equivalent circuit diagram, which is shown here. To uh, make a little uh, forecast, we then conducted all kinds of experiments to find out what conventional source of energy could be the source for the electrical energy that is available on the electrodes of a crystal cell. After years of uh, measurements and experiments, we could not find any conventional source of energy and therefore we started to look for other explanations and one which was very likely is to <coughs> look into the quantum field and uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, os oscillation as a source of uh, energy. Finally, the theoretic approach goes much further and nowadays there are theories discussed in the physical community, uh, community where the time itself receives a new meaning. A meaning that is so much different from the time that centuries ago when, for example, Newton generated the, 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 the laws, formulated the, the laws, how, how the planets in our solar system uh, move, um, that um, no, nowadays the theory is um, going away from time as a continuously flowing something towards a physical entity as it can be seen, for example, for a mass, let's say one kilogram of mass. What is the common ground for, for both? It, it's the energy. Uh, about uh, how 100 years ago, uh, Albert Einstein found an equivalence of a mass and energy with this famous formula E equal uh, mass times speed of light squared. And nowadays we have discussions in the physics community that time itself could also have an equivalent of energy. And this is the level where we assume the energy of the crystal cell comes from. Let's now have a closer look at the concrete measurement results that we, we got in order to find out about the parameters of a crystal cell. Usually when modeling an energy converter, one has to do several measurements, which then allow to determine the internal electrical components, which generates the equivalent circuit diagram. Such a measurement is, for example, to measure the voltage in an open circuit situation. That voltage was measured, measured as um, 
1.23 volts. Then the second measurement is to uh, determine the short circuit current, which can be seen immediately after putting the measurement the device to the crystal cell. That was 10.2 milliamps. When leaving that current measurement for some time on, then the current dropped down and the enduring short circuit current could be determined as 4.2 milliamps. This already shows that there is a dynamics inside the crystal cell, which we modeled using a capacitance. And the value of the capacitance could be determined by looking at the time constant, which can be determined from the run of the current starting at the measurement start and going for, for some time uh, minutes uh, forward. This all provided to an equivalent circuit diagram where we have a current source as the actual source of energy. And that, that is important that a crystal cell represents basically a current source source of current and not a source of a voltage as a usual battery. The actual value of the current source could be determined to 7.25 milliamps at a temperature of 24 degree Celsius. When doing the same me measurement at a different temperature, we came to the conclusion that the crystal cell has a temperature coefficient, which is 0 0.45 milliamps per Kelvin. That current source internally works against a 170 ohm resistor, where in parallel we have a huge capacitance, 20 farad, which is responsible for the dynamics of the crystal cell. To the outside interfacing, we have a 120 ohm resistor. This equivalent circuit diagram allows to predetermine an optimal operation condition for the crystal cell, which is known from electrical circuit theory by using such a load that half of the uh, energy is dissipated inside uh, the energy converter and half is dissipated outside or in, in other words to receive the maximum power on the outer electrodes and that load resistor had a value of 1.2 kilo ohms next slide Yes. Okay, yeah, we go to the next slide. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> the next uh, question that we were interested in was about the an energy that could be uh, get from the crystal cell. In order to have a feeling uh, how it is in, uh, in co uh, comparison to, to other uh, batteries, we selected a reference a battery, a rechargeable uh, a battery, which had approximately the same size as the uh, crystal uh, cell. That battery at that time, which means 15 years uh, ago, 2006-2007, had a uh, charge capacity of uh, 2,900 milli. Uh, ampere uh, hours. And uh, then we did an experiment that both energy devices were loaded with a resistor and we monitored the energy output over a longer time. We had to do it 
during a long time because the, the energy output from a crystal cell is relatively small with one, uh, milli uh, one milliwatt and um, well th therefore it took a, a long time 113 days to exhaust the energy from the rechargeable battery however after that time short before 3000 milliampere hours the rechargeable battery gave, gave up and uh, was empty that was not the case with the crystal cell which continued to deliver energy however after some time a uh, corrosion uh, effect may be the, the reason why it did not continue in the same intensity as before nevertheless we had after uh, more than than a year in energy output that was at least double the energy that we received from the rechargeable battery of the same size this was actually the the purpose of the experiment to show that uh, the crystal cell is able to deliver a continuous stream of energy which is bigger than that of existing battery rechargeable batteries in this theory of electrical systems there is a uh, dependency between the temperature or the, the thermal energy in the energy con converter and the outer load usually when for example a generator in a power plant is operated then there is a lot of heat that has to be uh, de dealt with, with in order to to operate that energy device so the, the question for the crystal cell was is there an equivalent dissipation of thermal heat when putting an external load to the crystal cell in order to answer that question we set up a computer controlled experiment which added a load to the crystal cell for seven hours and then for another seven hours the load was disconnected and then a sen very sensitive temperature measurement with a resolution below one millikelvin showed us the temperature of the housing of, of the uh, crystal cell because of the high resolution of the temperature measurement we has to uh, we, we, we had to take the 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 temperature run into account which was caused by, by ambient temperature changes day and night because the, the experiment itself took longer than a day N nevertheless the result of the experiment can be seen when looking at the faces where the load was switched on and when comparing it against the faces where the load was switched off and actually we couldn't find any direct re relationship between switching the load on and off and the run of the temperature the temperature run seems to be solely determined by the run of the ambient temperature outside of the Th the thermal um, uh, isolation that that we applied here
well, what is the conclusion from this experiment? The conclusion is that there is no me measurable temperature run, temperature change inside the crystal cell when taking energy on its outer elect electrodes. And this makes the, this device unique because it does not follow the usual behavior, for example, of a battery. A battery would rise its temperature when loading it with an external load. On the other hand, there are other systems which are known as energy harvesting systems, which manage to convert the energy of the ambient heat into electrical energy, those devices would have a, a lowering of, of the, the temperature. However, in case of the crystal cell, we couldn't see any rise or, or a fall of the, the temperature. So the conclusion is that um, the crystal cell is a energy conversion device which most likely is, cannot be explained by usual battery behavior and it can most likely not be explained by the principle of an energy harvesting device from, from heat. The measurement continued by uh, putting a loaded crystal cell into a thermal uh, isolation and then heating it up by a uh, heater step by step. The, the chart uh, is different from other charts because the, the time is running from uh, the right hand side to the left hand side because this it was developed for another purpose and we ju uh, just used the measurement uh, instrumentation for this experiment. The crystal cell started at 24 degrees Celsius and uh, was then heated for some time. After a couple of, of time, uh, several hours, it reached a level somewhat be below 28 degree and was left on that level for some hours. Then again the heating was switched on in order to get to the next level, again to the next level, next level, next level and, and so on. During that time the voltage on the loaded crystal cell was, was measured and one could see that along with temperature also the energy output of the crystal cell increased with any every level of temperature uh, in, increased we had a higher energy output. Then when switching the, the heating off the temperature fall down and it was then in a short time uh, un un uninterrupted brought back to the same level. During that experiment we observed that there was a, a level where the rise of the energy output did not follow the, the, the high uh, rise before, but it was such a stable plateau that, that we had and that was at about uh, 37 degrees Celsius, 36, 37 degrees Celsius. This is remarkable because it suggests that the working principle of the crystal cell could have 
some relationship to processes inside biological systems which maintain a temperature at a level of 36, 37 degree. Well, the experiment was also done and on, on a second uh, crystal cell and uh, so we could confirm the results that we received on the first crystal cell also with the second crystal cell. be exactly on the arrow here. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, when looking at the output of the crystal cell, we of course first have a DC output in the range of a voltage 1.2, 1 to 1.5 volts. And uh, in addition, we looked at small variation of that output voltage, which could be called the noise on the DC voltage. And when, then we set up an experiment which tried to determine whether there are exceptional observations on the noise of the crystal cell, which could be in relation to events happening on, on the sun. The question behind that experiment was whether energetic events in the sun could have an impact on the behavior of the crystal cell. Finally, we could exclude that or put that assumption aside because the events that were registered uh, on, on the sun, for example, at a observation frequency 245 uh, megahertz, which are well documented in available in the internet, those could not be found on the charts of the crystal cell. Instead, we observed that there was a jumping of the, of the noise level, basically between two levels, which are approximately three decibel away. Three decibel, three dB, that's a remarkable step for a noise signal. And uh, we could find a correlation between the, the switching points of the noise level and the temperature and could conclude that a very small change of a temperature from 23 degree to um, 100 millikelvin or 200 millikelvin higher caused a reduction of the noise level. And when going back with the temperature, then the noise level again jumped back to the previous level what could be the information behind that observation? The ob observation uniquely points towards an internal behavior of the crystal cell, which is complex, which cannot be explained by a simple electrochemical reaction, for, for example, but by a more complex behavior, most likely related to the impact of the water, which is bound in the material in the volume of the crystal cell. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a short comment, if, if I may uh, put that. Yeah, sure, please. Uh, this chart maybe relates to the chart before, where we found that at 37 degrees Celsius, there is a leveling off of the power or reduction in power, because w with water, what I what I'm, I'm what is just coming to my mind is that um, uh, water has uh, several phase transitions. One is not only at zero degrees Celsius where it moves from from ice to uh, liquid, but between um, in the liquid state between zero degrees up to hundred degrees Celsius, 
At obviously at 37 degrees Celsius, there is a hot spot where quantum fluctuations can do their job especially efficiently. And that's why the protein folding process works best at 37 degrees Celsius. But there are other uh, uh, temperature hotspots uh, yeah, in, in, in the area of 37 degrees Celsius. So there could be one at 20 degrees Celsius or at 45 or mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, what they found is, and, and that is now the interesting uh, part, is that uh, the ability for water to capture the energy from quantum fluctuations um, is not working better the colder it is, as you want, well, as one would assume, because mm -hmm. temperature overrides the quantum fluctuations. But it 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 moves in a non-linear way. So when you heat up water, then um, there are spots where quantum fluctuations, even at a higher temperature, can work more efficient on the oscillation of the hydrogen bond. Okay. And that is so interesting. So what we maybe see here, when we jump here from, I don't know, from 23 degrees Celsius and, and a little bit higher to, to, to yeah, a few hundred millikelvin higher, then uh, that there is around 23 degrees Celsius, there is a, um, a hot spot where the, the, the quantum fluctuations cannot act as efficiently anymore yeah or 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 uh, or just oscillate in a different way with where, where the where the um uh frequency pattern of the uh, of the water changes and that has a drastic change in amplitude because this can't be an electromagnetic signal because there it's it's closed in the faraday cage already due to the aluminium casing where it is in so a three decibel jump of an amplitude is not a minor thing so that 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 energy must come from somewhere so there's a change in energy and here we have again a rise in amplitude again which is an increase so um, when we drop the temperature and that clearly shows that there is a very fine line and because the temperature change is only a few hundred millikelvin here and that has such a drastic change that shows there is um, a uh, uh, yeah l let's call it a quantum critical phase transformation mm -hmm. in the water where uh, water moves from one behavior to another behavior and that is caused by quantum fluctuations and yeah i just wanted to put that in as a side note yeah thank you i think this uniquely demands for further research yes on this um, measurement ob observation which is reproducible which uh, can, can can be measured on on crystal cell and um, more uh, a profound theoretical explanation is, is needed for, for this behavior. Well, uh, we already had an experiment where we switched the load on a crystal cell on and off in order to find out about the temperature change of the crystal cell. Here in this experiment, we do basically the same, but in a shorter time frame of only seven minutes and the question behind the experiment was how the self recharge behavior of the crystal cell works which was already mentioned before that after a short circuit for many years the crystal cell managed to recharge to the previous voltage of 1.2 to 1.5 volts inside of a few minutes so this experiment should shed some, some light on, on that behavior. So a um, load resistor of about, uh, yeah, it's, it's of about 312 ohms was used and again automatically by, by computer switched on and off. The experiment was conducted over a longer time of 120 days and for every day a chart was generated as it is shown, for example, here for one of the first days. We see that uh, when switching the, the external load on, then first the voltage drops immediately down. Then we have some dynamic behavior here until the output uh, reaches a certain level that can be maintained over several minutes. Then when switching the, the load off, we, we, go to, uh, we get to the beginning here 
and we see that the voltage on the crystal cell recharges itself, first a bigger jump and then some dynamics after it then tunes in to the previous voltage level. What is difficult to see here is that uh, the minimum and, and maximum run of the, the voltage is very close to the average. Basically the, the curves are uh, overlaid on it. This means that the behavior is very reproducible and that no variations can be really detected from that self-charging behavior. In addition to the voltage run, also the noise was registered again because we had this interesting observation related to noise before. So we ask how does the noise behave during a self recharge phase? And we saw that the noise level first dropped down and then it got into an oscillating mode for a few seconds where it gets higher and lower and higher and, and, and lower. And this again is such a unique behavior which demands for further research how this can be explained which is usually not, not seen in conventional energy uh, con converters. Well, on the uh, side where the crystal cell is loaded, we have first a drop of the noise level, then a very steep uh, rise of the, the noise level before it com comes down. And in this case, we have only a small oscillation here on the um, dis dissipation side of the, the diagram. On other days, we also had a higher oscillation here and a, a lower oscillation here on, on the other side, which again suggests that there are internal pr pr procedures in the crystal cell which take place and which change with time from one day to the other. Well, just to explain how the noise was re registered, because this may be an important question for someone who tries to understand it. Well, we, we basically zoomed into the, the noise by calculating the absolute change from one measure value to the next measurement value so un uh, minus un minus one and the absolute value of that was then uh, accumulated and divided by the number of measurements n which gives the value which is here called the noise signal well the the average power that we could get from a crystal cell was 1.4 milliwatt. The next ex experiment aimed at getting some more insight into the external behavior of the energy output of a crystal cell. This was done by putting different load resistors to the, the crystal cell which then resulted in different output voltages. So first we loaded the crystal cell with approximately 1.2 uh, kilo ohm and got an, an output uh, volt, voltage in uh, the, the order of um, yeah 1.2 1 volts and uh, an output current which then r reached um, a level of 1.6 1.67 uh, uh, milliamps when further reducing this um, load resistor we came to 
sm of obviously two smaller and smaller voltages on the outer electrodes of the crystal cell. So 668 millivolts, 499 millivolts. And when looking at the current that was registered, one can see that the crystal cell really works as a current source, which means that it can maintain a stable current output over a broad range of load resistors and a resulting broad range of voltages on its outer electrodes here in this is case shown from 157 millivolts up to 1.2 volts. So this experiment was a confirmation that the crystal cell is not a conventional voltage source as a chemical battery for example or as a generator in a power plant. No, it is a current source. And this has to be taken into account when trying to generate uh, devices which make use of crystal cells. The noise, the registration of noise had another interesting observation. When leaving the crystal cell um, with a stable load on its own over multiple days and registering the very small change which comes from the outer temperature change of ambient uh, temperature and at that point another unexpected observation could be done that at a certain temperature we have suddenly an increase in the noise level which can be called a resonance so here again we have a behavior of the crystal cell which demands for further research why the noise level has such a resonance behavior when the temperature of the crystal cell goes through a well-defined uh, point of, of uh, the, the temperature of the, of the crystal cell. Here again, we, we, we see the, uh, an overshoot of the, the voltage when uh, during the self-recharge process. This chart, uh, uh, chart again runs from the right to the, to, to the left. So we see that after disconnecting the load resistor, we first have a higher voltage, which then levels uh, down to a certain uh, voltage level before the, the load is switched on again and the voltage drops, drops down. So this is a zoomed view of the behavior in the very moment when the load is switched off and the crystal cell starts to recharge its voltage, the voltage on its own. When looking at the source of energy for a new energy device, one also has to take into account a possible working principle related to the nuclear energy. It's well known that, for example, a nuclear battery, which is used for operating space probes for many years, that it is capable of delivering energy for a very long time. So we checked whether the crystal cell could be related to nuclear decay. This could be falsified by putting the crystal cell into a gamma spectrometer, leaving it there for about uh, 16 hours and looking at the counts per energy level which revealed that the usual background counts were received for, for example, for lead to 212, for uh, uran 235, bismuth, uh, cesium. Every count uh, uh, level uh, on, on, on a level is related to a um, nu nuclear 
uh, decay which is common to the the background in 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 uh, uh, air so we could exclude that the crystal cell is pa pa powered on a nuclear level well when summarizing the ob observation uh, of the crystal cell we can conclude that most likely the crystal cell is not powered by an electrochemical reaction because it could be shown that it is a current source not a voltage source and that there is no temperature dependency from from load we could also exclude that most likely the crystal cell is not an energy harvesting device uh, harvesting energy from heat because of this missing temperature dependency from load the electromagnetic impact is one major question that comes in first place from from an engineer asking whether external electromagnetic fields could be the source of energy we could exclude that by conducting the experiments in a faraday uh, cage which shields outer electromagnetic energy from the crystal cell and we could also exclude that the energy comes from a nuclear decay by putting the crystal cell in a gamma spectrometer where it doesn't did not show any unusual radiation well in uh, um, when, when concluding the result of the, the experiments one can uh, summarize the unusual observations as follows first of all the crystal cell is a current source not a voltage source in opposite to conventional batteries then when cooling down a crystal cell for example is liquid nit nitrogen then it is not destroyed however the crystal cell recharges itself when it the temperature comes back to a normal uh, temperature for example ab above 20 degree this is different uh, from um, conventional batteries which would be destroyed when putting them into that uh, um, low temperature uh, usually it is unusual for crystal cell behavior that the self recharging takes place after a, a load cycle and that even after a multi-year short circuit a crystal cell is recharging on its own so one can say that operating a crystal cell in a short circuit mode is is a one of a normal operation mode which cannot be done with a electrochemical battery for example which would be destroyed in that case it is unusual that there is an overshooting in the end of a self recharge process and um, a very unusual feature is the behavior of the noise uh, figures on the output voltage which depend on on both on the load and on the temperature and it's very reproducible and can be ob observed in um, the condition that were just described be before one thing that needs special attention is the jumping of the noise level at certain temperatures which uh, suggests that there are internal processes in the crystal cell um, which relate to other physical phenomena possibly related to water However, one of the most interesting features of the crystal cell is the rising of the power with temperature. Basically, one can observe a doubling of the output energy every three degrees. 
So when going from 23 degrees uh, or 24 degrees to 27 de degrees, we get double the energy output. When heating it up further to 30 degrees, we again get double the output. That continues up to the temperature of 37 degree. Also above that temperature, a rise can be observed uh, up to a um, temperature of, of about 60 degree, where the working principle of the crystal cell possibly is um, put into a non-workable -work state and uh, the, the energy output then will, 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 be, will go down to, to zero. So the conclusion is that crystal cells can be operated from room temperature, well, up to a temperature of 40, 50 degree uh, Celsius, and uh, one should avoid to, to heat them up to higher temperature, and it should never uh, exceed the temperature of 60 degree. Yeah, okay, Eckert, thank you very much uh, for the compilation of measurement data. I will just uh, say a short word towards the end of this presentation. Um, uh, a question that we already addressed is where does or could the energy come from from the crystal cell? This is a personal view. Uh, I have no uh, physical proof for it. However, there are some measurements that would support um, uh, my perspective. Now, electrochemical effects, they play a certain role. We have a, a situation where um, aluminum air battery or aluminum corrosion battery effect could be existing. However, one gram of aluminum produces about uh, three amperage hours. And when uh, putting the crystal cell on the load for one year about, I could calculate the current and therefore the amount of uh, possible uh, corroded aluminium and I have found or measured a 10 times lower amount of corroded aluminium con in, in, in comparison to the current generated. So there should be another source of current and that fits together that the cell is a current source and uh, where does the energy or come from. Now I assume that it does not only come from thermal energy but from quantum fluctuations from the zero point energy due to the quantum critical nature. Now, water is, from my view, actually one of the most classic examples for quantum critical material. Um, and quantum criticality does not only play at, at zero or close to zero Kelvin a role. We have so-called non-zero quantum critical phase transitions. And uh, it is known that at room temperature uh, or even at 37 degrees Celsius, the uh, hydrogen bridges are driven by quantum fluctuations, uh, which makes it a non-zero quantum critical material par excellence. And uh, so um, I think this is a, an option that really should be considered. And um, uh, so, yeah, I assume that the crystal cell could be operated by the zero point energy fluctuations and also the um, calorimetric measurements and the measurements of the amplitude shift um, support that view very well. However, these are only first, um, this is the first walking attempt trying to explain um, hard to explain effects. <laughs> and um, uh, so I have to leave it at this point and who knows, maybe future research will bring more clarity to it. Now, what happened to the crystal cell project? It was sort of uh, came more or less to an end around 2012. And um, uh, we found that in the end, also due to the temperature dependency, um, uh, that the weight to volume ratio, uh, the, I mean, the output to weight to volume ratio is so small that it has, uh, yeah, an economical value is hard to determine. There is one application that would be doable, that's the, the, that are these smoke detectors that are on the ceiling of, of nearly every room. And in warm countries where we don't have uh, a winter, so to speak, one could actually use these crystal cells, which again would be quite a significant market. And one could also 
uh, uh, build uh, sort of um, not street lights, but lights that are on a pathway, on, on a walking uh, a pedestrian pathway. And um, when this whole uh, the, 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 the whole um, tube of, of that thing that is next to the road uh, is full of crystal cells and we have a warm country, then one could uh, power some LEDs that are switched on with a, with a motion detection device. However, these were ideas, but it's, uh, uh, it would be quite a mission to do that. And um, anyway, um, my personal um, intention is uh, I wanted to have a better version of a crystal cell, uh, namely a crystal cell where we can completely exclude possible electrical chem chemical effects right from the beginning. And number two, that has a significantly higher power output. And third, where we can understand in a better way the uh, physics uh, of the material in the cell, because there are still processes in the uh, silicate and water that are of course not clear. And to find that out is uh, from what we understand today, that is uh, quite a project. So uh, only with appropriate funding, uh, one can get to, to, the, to further details of that. So anyway, in 2012, another, um, yeah, I further developed the hypothesis and I moved from the crystal cell from the sodium meter silicate nano hydrate to a uh, to ferroelectric ceramics and what we are doing today is we are combining quantum paraelectrics with ferroelectric ceramics creating a quantum ferroelectric material and that is what we are recing, researching today at quantum power munich and uh, we also managed to get a, a small financing for that and since a few years we are involved with that so make it in short the crystal cell um, I assume the crystal cell is converting the energy from quantum fluctuations, meaning from the zero point energy to separate the charges. And uh, this is done via the water molecules due to its quantum critical nature uh, in the silicate environment, creating a direct current. And in the FCO, which stands for ferroelectric crystal oscillator, we are also using quantum fluctuations to separate the charges but not via water molecules, but via an unbalanced or directed domain wall acceleration. And that also creates a direct current component. Okay, that was an update on the crystal cell and thanks for listening. See you next time.